<laughs> My name is Chuck Tooley, I'm chairman of the board of the Wheeler Center for Public Policy and just delighted to be here tonight. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get to both, I live in Billings, I was lucky enough to get here early enough for the seminar conducted by our guest speaker tonight, Larry Abramson. There are only 11 of us in the room, so there was a lot of great give and take, wonderful questions and answers, and I know that uh, that he'll be just as good tonight, if not better. Right, Larry? Right, absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, um, just want to talk to you a little bit about the Wheeler Center. Somebody asked me what it was, and so I thought maybe there are a few people in this room that would like to know briefly uh, what the Wheeler Center for Public Policy does. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy center that explores issues of importance to Montana. And we uh, conduct conferences, we sponsor lectures like the one tonight. Our conferences are in subjects like the aging of Montana, uh, the cost of water, the new economy, uh, the future of coal, early childhood education, and on and on and on. The next one coming up will be in September, right here in Bozeman, it'll be on agriculture and climate change. So that'll be the 26th and 27th. If you're interested, we'd love to have you register. Go to wheelercenter.org, or you can go on Facebook and uh, just like us and friend us, and you'll get all the updates through your Facebook account. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the executive director of the Wheeler Center for Public Policy, who is also a professor of political science at the university. Uh, my pleasure to present him to you now, Eric Austin. Eric, thank you. So good evening. Thank you so much um, for that welcome and for coming out this evening. Um, I've got just two uh, other logistical items that I want to share with you, and then we'll uh, introduce our speaker this evening and, and probably get out of the way. Um, the first of those two logistical items is that I would also like to let you know that uh, before our conference next fall, we are also hosting a book talk and book signing with Mark Johnson, um, who will be talking about a new biography uh, about Senator Wheeler that was, has just been released. That book talk is going to be on the afternoon of April 17th. It'll be in the Procrastinator Theater at the Strand Union Building on campus. Uh, so please think about joining us for that event as well. It's open to the public, no tickets are required, so please think about attending that too. Um, and then the other logistical item that I wanted to let you know about is that um, following Larry's comments, we'll have a little bit of opportunity for some question and answer. Um, sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Larry. Um, because we don't have a, uh, we are recording, video recording this uh, event so that others uh, who couldn't attend this afternoon uh, can watch it after the fact. Um, we don't have a handheld mic for the Q&A period, so I'm going to ask you to speak up when you uh, offer your questions, and Larry, I'm going to ask you to maybe okay. briefly summarize those for the, so that we can capture it for the video. Um, but I look forward to the opportunity to have some conversation about the issues that Larry is going to talk about this evening. So moving on then, um, I guess a little bit more wet by way of introduction. I think we all understand the importance of the media and democratic politics um, and the central role that it has in ensuring transparency and accountability and the role it can play in supporting and sort of facilitating democracy as a marketplace of, of ideas. To some degree, this is, I think, so central to our political culture that it's treated, or at least it has been treated, it maybe up until the last two years or maybe the last five or 10 years, as being sort of self-evident and more or less unassailable. I think it's worth noting as we start a conversation about the media tonight, um, and particularly about whether facts can save us, uh, probably no spoiler there, that's a challenge. <laughs> um, but whether facts can save us, to note that um, the central role that the media plays is um, relatively new in sort of a um, political history. Right? The notion of um, what we now have ensconced in the First Amendment 
is something that in human history and political history is relatively new. But even beyond the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, um, to some degree the role that the media has is also a reflection of changes in technology and changes in culture. And most specifically, I'm thinking here about um, the newspaper industry and the growth of the newspaper industry at the end of the 19th and the beginnings of the 20th century and the degree to which that is tied to changes in paper technology. Being able to, be, um, being able to produce relatively inexpensive paper for newspapers. And the challenge that that poses then is if all of a sudden newspaper publishers can print many, many more copies of any given paper at a much lower price, how do you sell them? Right? How do you saturate the market? And one of the strategies is to move away from niche journalism to more central forms of journalism, right? away from yellow journalism to a more centric form of journalism. And that also, I think it's worth noting, coincides with other social and economic changes, right? So at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, you got urbanization and industrialization and the emergence of the progressive era, right? So you think about novels like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and the importance of the media ultimately then in reform efforts, right? So not only is the media and the role of the media in democracy a political issue, but it's also a social issue, it's an economic issue, and it's a te technological issue. And I raise that point for really two reasons. One is to, I think, highlight the fact that we've seen it in recent years, technology changes, right? And so the advent of the internet and digital technology and the impact that that has is something that we're still wrestling with and will presumably for the foreseeable future. But figuring that out is not a new, or it's not a first time challenge for us. The other piece that I wanted to highlight out of that anecdote or those changes in technology is, and I think it's also important to understand that the role of the media is not a given. Moreover, it's not um, teleological. And what I mean by that is that it's not a one directional arrow of becoming increasingly progressive or increasingly powerful, increasingly transparent. It's something that we have to pay attention to and nurture and probably struggle for. And so it's really in that context that I am really excited and privileged to welcome our speaker for this evening. So as a quick biographical introduction, um, I just want to note that Larry Abramson um, entered into his career in journalism by way of undergraduate and graduate degrees in creative writing. If Com I write comparative it. literature. Comparative literature. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just want to sort of note as a little bit of an aside for all of those who have been told that you can't do something exciting with your career if you have a degree in the humanities. There is a case in point, but that's not at all the case. All right. um, and then went on uh, in the early 90s to join NPR where he was an editor and also served uh, in an initiative to increase the diversity of the staff, and particularly the correspondence and writing staff and reporting staff at NPR. Um, throughout the course of his career, also served as a correspondent, focusing on areas including national security, um, reported on issues including the challenges to civil liberties following 9-11, the recovery of New Orleans, after Katrina and a whole host of, of other topics over the course of the 2000s. Uh, in most, not most recently, but after serving for uh, a number of years at NPR, was then appointed as the Dean of uh, Journalism at the University of Montana, where he served for a number of years and now most recently has been appointed to a, a position as the Special Advisor to the Provost at the University of Montana. So with that background in mind, um, please join me in welcoming Mr. Larry Abramson to the stage. Thank you. I hope this, is this, uh, this isn't too loud, is it? Getting a little bit of feedback here. I'll move this a little bit away from me. So. Um, I just want to thank the Wheeler Center and, uh, and Eric for, uh, for welcoming me to uh, DeBozeman. See if I can get this even further away. Um, 
it, it's nice to be back over here. Um, I don't get a chance to come over, and of course we're not encouraged to cross the divide <laughs> over uh, because we all know that uh, there are hostile uh, forces on the side of the divide, and we uh, we don't want to be confronted by them. Um, but uh, the truth is, I don't really know the difference between a grizzly and a bobcat, and I don't really care. So um, I, I don't get into any of these uh, interstate rivalries. Um, driving over the pass today was uh, kind of a sentimental journey for me because it was just about five years ago that my wife and I uh, made the drive in the other direction from Washington, D.C. Uh, with, uh, with all of our junk in the back of the car. And um, I had, uh, as you can imagine, anybody who's been through this, it wasn't easy to persuade somebody living in the suburbs of D.C. that it was really a good idea to move to Montana uh, in, the, in the middle of summer uh, in the, the uh, later stages of my career. And then we, um, we spent the night at the Homewood Suites, I think, actually, so just down the street. And we got up in the morning, we drove over the pass while the sun was, uh, was still coming up. And uh, my wife stuck her head out the window and started screaming, we live here. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it was just, this place looked, just looks so exotic to us after, after DC and uh, after a lifetime on the East Coast. And um, you know, we've had the experience where we've uh, repeated that phrase with a different emphasis in the years since then, like, we live here? Uh, why do we live here? Uh, and then after f four years of budget cuts at UM, uh, I think the only thing that we have left to say is we're still alive, you know, we're still surviving. So um, when I came to Montana, um, I had one of those series of job interviews that they have in academia, and nobody warned me about this. So there's probably some academics in the room, but those of you who have real jobs know that uh, traditionally when you go for a job interview, you sit down with the boss, maybe he or she takes you out to dinner, they introduce you to a few of the uh, people in the office, and that's it. You either get the job or you don't. Well, uh, when you do an academic job interview, it's sort of like a quinceanera or something. You, you are introduced to the community, you're introduced to the mayor, you're introduced to all of the faculty, you have to do a presentation to the faculty, you're introduced to the staff senate. Uh, there are things that I didn't know that I existed, that existed that I had to, uh, to talk in front of. And, um, and uh, I, had a, I had a lot of lunches. I was taken out to lunch, I think, at every restaurant uh, in Missoula. Uh, anyway, it was a shock. And um, I realized that this was not just another job where I was working for myself to bring home a paycheck, that this was kind of a public trust in a lot of ways, and that people uh, kind of think that they own the media, right? So you're going to be doing this uh, important job of training our kids how to get into journalism. And um, we're not going to let you do that unless we can uh, pass, you know, uh, unless you pass muster. Um, so uh, I, I tried to appear as confident as I could that at that time I knew what was going to happen in the world of journalism so that they would trust me uh, with this awesome responsibility. Um, and I, you know, I kind of talked myself up a little bit. This was 2014. And I said, you know, I think we know where things are going. I mean, podcasts are becoming more popular. Uh, some online strategies are starting to make money. The New York Times has come out with a new app. And, um, you know, I think that if we, if we just teach our kids digital strategies and uh, imbue them with the right ethics, uh, they'll do fine. Uh, so again, this was 2014. Donald Trump was still a distant annoyance on the horizon for many of us in the media. Like, why do we have to worry about this guy? Um, we had no idea that, um, th that he would become president and that our entire way of dealing with people in power was, was really going to change. And that the digital revolution that was, had already been uh, shaking us to our, to our core was going to continue to mutate and twist and turn in ways that we, uh, we just could not uh, anticipate it. Um, years ago, uh, NPR came to me, I think this was in the 90s, and asked me if I would like to become the head of the, their web page, which was something they had just launched at that time. And the web page was basically just a place where you could um, click 
on the name of a story and a little summary would pop up. And if you had really cool internet access, you might actually be able to listen to the story. But there were no photographs, there was no text, there was nothing. And I said, well, this sounds like a great idea. I think we should really be doing this. this was, I think, 1995. Um, but I'm going to need a staff. You know, we're going to have to produce all kinds of content. We're going to have to interact with listeners. And, you know, it's going to be a really important conversation. This isn't just um, a static piece of paper. And they said, no, no, you're supposed to do this alone, you know, by yourself. And I said, no, thanks. I think I'll, I'll stay as a reporter. And, of course, now the web staff of NPR is, um, I, I don't know, it's in the hundreds probably. It was, when I left, it was the only area that was growing because, of course, they were trying to shed journalists um, at the time. Um, so, uh, so things have changed. And uh, let's just suffice it to say that um, I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to see the future. It was a lot more complicated than I, than I thought. You guys ever have this problem that your PowerPoint sometimes talks without you actually uh, telling it what to say? You know, don't, don't pay any attention to those extra words that appear. Um, so again, I did not know that uh, not only was our understanding of the political process going to change, but our understanding of what reality was going to change, right? That now, today, we no longer know what the truth is, right? That's, it, that was inconceivable to me back then. I was pretty sure I knew what the truth was. It was mostly whatever a politician wasn't telling me. And it was my job to tell you what the truth was. Well, um, you know, now we, now we know that things are a little bit more complicated. Um, this was brought home to me when uh, a couple years after taking the deanship at uh, UM, I sat up watching election returns in 2016 uh, in my home in Missoula. And my son, who was in the Air Force in Okinawa, Japan, uh, Skyped in with us. And we were going to watch the elections together, because this was as close as we could get. And he, because he wanted to know what, he wanted his dad, the journalist, and his stepmom, who's also a famous Washington Post journalist, to explain to him what was going on as we marched toward the inevitable conclusion of that, of that evening. Sorry about this thing. Maybe, can you hear me okay if I don't really use this? Yeah, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we said, well, well, you know, these uh, certain states are coming in before the other states, and uh, it's all going to work out the way the media predicted. Uh, don't worry about it. And, uh, of course, you know, in addition to everything else that happened to the rest of the country, uh, I was completely humiliated by the fact that I did not know how to explain what was going on that evening. Um, so uh, I pretended to happen to know, understand what was happening that night, um, but I didn't really. And, um, and we, did a, we did a terrible job of covering that election and a terrible job of uh, preparing you to vote, I think, in a lot of ways. So the, uh, the takeaway is don't turn to the media to predict the future. Uh, this is something I have long felt but been afraid to say because it's often viewed as our responsibility to tell us who's going to win the presidential election. We can't do that. Okay, now you know that, but we knew it all along that we weren't very good at this. We can take polls. We can sometimes, you know, take a pulse of the electorate, but we really do not know who's going to win. Uh, this has now happened twice in my lifetime. In the year 2000, uh, we also had no idea who was going to win. And even on the, after the votes were in, we didn't know when, uh, who was going to win in 2000. So that's not our job. And, um, you know, uh, don't ask us to do that, please. Now, well, okay, there are some other instances in history when we uh, mispredicted uh, the future. There was uh, the, the Iraq War when we indicated that there might be weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, we didn't predict the 2008 housing crash. Um, and, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, the, uh, the election coverage. But, but other than that, our track record is completely clean. And, and we'll never do that again, I, I, pr I absolutely promise. Um, so why do people ask us over and over again to predict the future? Um, you guys all get your mutual fund statements, right, on your investments. What does it say on the top of the mutual fund investment? Past returns are no guarantee of future returns, right? That the past does not predict the future. But do you occasionally say, crap, this, this mutual fund is getting 20% and I'm getting four. I'm going to call my broker and tell him to jump over to the 20%, right? You ever do that? 
No? Okay, I'm guessing the only one who, who does that kind of thing. I constantly feel like I'm on the wrong train. Well, it's the same thing uh, with, uh, with elections, and I would, uh, I would say that even uh, some of our august faculty uh, at MSU have found that they cannot predict uh, 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 electoral behavior. Uh, and Professor Austin was confessing to me that his model was built on a rational human being, uh, and he was going to have to revise that model after some <laughs> of the things uh, that have happened, uh, happened recently. So, um, but you know, the truth is that uh, despite those screw-ups, and despite recent history, I still believe that organizations that study history and try to learn from it are the better informed that they're better citizens. I guess it's just the humanist, the humanities guy, the comp lit guy in me that believes that we need to keep trying to learn from history, that we can't give up on that. Um, so we have to walk that fine line uh, between trying to predict who's going to win the race and what matters in the race. This is an old story, right? We've all been through elections where we asked the media to tell us more about the issues that are at stake and to focus less on the horse race. Um, but it's getting difficult, more difficult to do this. If you uh, had been in my shoes, you would frequently find yourself being asked to incorporate uh, polling data into some of the reporting that you do. It's just an inevitable trend because uh, it's future shock, right? It's, as things move faster, we expect a return, we expect information to, uh, to predict the future faster. Now there's no better example of our inability to anticipate the future than our own industry. We've been deeply handicapped when it comes to understanding the changes that are happening in the media. We all have blown this deeply and there were times when I think we thought we were going to, to lose it, that we were going to lose the press in this country because the business models of organizations like the New York Times, which I cannot imagine this country without, um, you know, could possibly go under. Uh, NPR has almost gone under because of, uh, uh, well, because of a number of things, but, uh, but among others, because of the digital revolution. If you've had a chance to read uh, Jill Abramson's recent book, The Merchants of Truth, uh, she's no relation to me. I, I wish she was. She's a very smart woman. Um, you'll see how papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post dragged their feet going into the digital era for some very good reasons, but uh, they made some embarrassing mistakes. Now, one of the things I hope we can address tonight is the public, the public under, uh, has a misunderstanding of what the media should be doing and what the media actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's my experience that non-journalists just really don't know uh, what, what the job of a journalist is. And that lack of understanding is, is at the heart of one of the earthquakes that rumbled through our business during the last election and the fake news debate. I wonder what you all think. What is it that reporters actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, this is it, okay? This, we talk to people. It's not brain surgery, but this is what we do all the time. Um, this is me uh, in 2008, I think, I'm a little younger, uh, talking to some students in China about higher education. Just a random, I don't have a lot of pictures of myself working, this is one I happened to dig up. Um, it was a pretty fun assignment. And um, sitting down and talking with people, sometimes for hours or days, is pretty much the most uh, the f most fundamental thing that we actually do. I don't know if people, if people know that. Has anybody here ever been interviewed by the media? Yeah, you have? Was it fun? Yeah? Uh, you know, I always hoped that it was, uh, you know, uh, Gay Talese used to say that he always put on a tie before he went in and did an interview with somebody because he wanted it, people to know that that was their special day. And I, I think for a lot of my interview subjects, it was. It, regardless of what they heard on the air and everything, that we had a good time. And that we talked about things that mattered to them and made them feel important. Um, and uh, that, that's only possible through sitting down and talking to people, I think, in most cases, uh, face to face. 
Now, uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and uh, go, go back to the, uh, the reference to why I didn't study journalism uh, originally in, in, in college. And that was, um, the, I was a comparative literature major who was going to become a professor, uh, like Professor Austin here, and have a good life. And then at some point, somebody explained to me that I had to learn Old High German before I could get my PhD. And I said, no way. Uh, regular German was hard enough. And for those of you who don't know, that, uh, Old High German is like a thousand years old. There's only a few fragments left, and I was going to have to spend a year learning it. Um, and I, I thought, um, I know how to write. I know how to talk to people. I come from a fa My dad was a salesman. My grandfather was a cab driver. Uh, most of my uncles were salesmen. Uh, I'm simply going to go out and uh, make a career out of talking to people and writing about it. Um, now, uh, when I tell uh, UM students about, about my career path, uh, I tell them that they do need a journalism degree because not everybody is as lucky as I was. But, uh, but this is mo what most reporters spend their time doing. Now, some of us are subject experts, and some of us have special tricks up our sleeve. Uh, but talking to people from a wide background is what distinguishes our profession and why it's so much fun. Um, this picture defines the day for most journalists, and I'd say uh, uh, another example uh, is, uh, is this. Uh, this is talking to not somebody on the street. Anybody recognize who this is? Leon Panetta, Leon Panetta okay. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to Chinese students, talking to regular students, talking to people who worked on the street, um, and, but I also spent some time talking to big shots, okay. Now, um, I have the fondest memories of talking to regular people, uh, but I also got to, but having a chance to sit next to Leon Panetta um, was also a, a blast. <laughs> True, uh, we do like to talk about war stories. Uh, this interview took place in the armed fortress that is the uh, Secretary of Defense's plane that he flies around the world with, the E-4B. And uh, we would, about, uh, me and about 50 journalists would accompany the secretary everywhere he went, from Kazakhstan to Singapore to New Zealand, uh, all over the place with about 100 armed guards, um, all kinds of surveillance equipment. Um, and it was thought to be newsworthy to accompany the secretary of defense on trips where he actually didn't say very much. Um, but, but we go because we want you to know what's going on in these obscure places. So whether we're talking to regular students or uh, truck drivers or secretaries of defense, um, it's the talk that matters. And it's the, the talk that really should keep us grounded. Anything that pulls you away from talk, I think, is dangerous. And I think that that's where journalism has gotten itself into trouble. The more you are sitting in front of your desk, the more you're staring at a computer, the more you're talking to other journalists, is it's contrary to the mission. Uh, I would say that uh, that also goes for living in uh, big East Coast uh, cities where I spent most of my career. And I tried to get out as often as I possibly could. Um, but that, that is one of the uh, mistakes that the Trump election helped expose is that we have to uh, stay away from the centers of power if we're going to find out what people are thinking. Now, um, sorry. So um, anyway, uh, the, re the reason I chose this picture is because this is the ultimate definition of a bubble, being inside a plane with somebody for, uh, I think we, we could fly for 18 hours at a time because the Secretary of Defense's plane can refuel in the air so that he doesn't have to land and waste time. That's how the federal government spends your money. And we did stories about that, the fact that this this plane is one of the most expensive pieces of equipment that ever carried a bunch of journalists around uh, to go to press conferences. Um, so, uh, you know, w there, there are lots of ways to, uh, 
to avoid talking to regular people and we need to resist those. This is another, uh, the, the, uh, one of the things, of course, that was going on while Secretary De, uh, Panetta was, um, was, was, in the de was in the Defense Department was the, the war in Afghanistan. And uh, this was 2013, that picture. Um, we, of course, were asking you know, how long the American involvement was going to last. At that time, it seemed to be just around the corner that the U.S. was going to pull out. And um, we're still there, right? So uh, our ability to predict the future um, when it comes to stories of war um, also needs some kind of re revision. So this is a key challenge that many of us in the teaching profession face. Getting students comfortable with talking to people from a wide variety of backgrounds getting them to approach strangers, getting them to use the phone. Uh, this is one of the toughest things for me and my students is they all want to communicate electronically. And um, uh, th the world has not changed that, that much that you can avoid talking to people face to face. Um, I'm unable to conceive of a healthy information environment without face to face or at least voice to voice, phone to phone conversations. And an even bigger, bigger challenge in this fact challenge era that we live is helping our audience understand the process of what reporters do. Now, this won't come as news to anyone, but we are trying to report the facts. It's not our only job, but it is a big part of it. We tell you what happened today. We explain to you that the world is still spinning on its axis and that the weather is never quite what we'd like it to be. Facts are real. But facts are just the beginning of a great story. Now, we're talking at one of the great universities in this great state of ours, or close to it. Uh, it's, and it's pretentious of me to talk to you about facts in a room with some great ap academics and very smart citizens in it. But how many of you believe that you are dealing with facts or searching with, for facts um, and searching for truth when you're dealing with the media? Uh, yeah, we do screw up. The media do make mistakes. Um, if, if you buy me a drink afterwards, I'll tell you about some of the stupider mistakes that I made. Um, but how many of you have made mistakes in public in front of millions of people? Well, I have. Um, and uh, it's, it is something to be ashamed of. Um, but it's something that, um, that we need to uh, confront and deal with. And, and we need to get back to facts. I think the journalists have confronted the fact that, that um, information has to be based on evidence. Now, what kind of evidence is it based on? Well, this is an example uh, just randomly chosen uh, that was the sort of thing that I dealt with when I was a daily journalist. It's a press release, OK? This one happens to be from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and it tells us that union membership was down from 2017 to 2018. Now, this is the kind of thing either my editor would hand me or I would find on my own. And uh, this is a fact. This is based on real data that was gathered by somebody who did uh, really hard work. Sometimes we would do this information gathering on our own, or sometimes we would ask the labor department, we would look to the labor department to do it for us. Um, but this is what good journalists do. We, we look for the story in this trend. Does it tell us that um, union membership is declining at the same rate among all different populations? Um, we try to stay close to the evidence that's in uh, documents like this. Are the people in your story who are expressing their own opinions, are they staying close to the evidence? You as readers and as viewers should know that, that you can scrutinize the evidence that you're being presented with. How many of you try to do that? It may seem unfair to ask you that, but do you ever read articles in the paper where you wondered, where did this come from? Where is the information that lies behind that? Sometimes, if you're lucky online, you can actually click and go to the study. And I would encourage you, rather than reading the entire paper, spend your day or your hour, or whatever, however much time you have, and go to the jump, go, to the, go click to the link, and see if the evidence that's being depicted there
backs up the assertion that people are saying. Lots of things are not backed up by as evidence. Not everything has been measured. And as I'm going to discuss later on, we are challenged by the fact that many news consumers still don't know what a fact is. Here's another example. This is a petition for a writ of certiorari before the Supreme Court. Uh, have any of you ever had a chance to read a Supreme Court decision or any of the briefs that go to the Supreme Court? Uh, it's really one of the highlights of my career was the day when Nina Totenberg got sick and they sent me to the, to the Supreme Court. It is one of the most challenging but the most interesting experiences you can possibly have is to actually read through these documents. Um, the American Legion filed this writ, uh, which is basically uh, asking the Supreme Court to take up an appeal uh, about asking uh, the a, uh, at, they're asking the Supreme Court to strike down a lower court ruling that said a war memorial in the shape of a cross is unconstitutional. Now this writ was filed in uh, June. The case was argued in February and now of course the Supreme Court is going to have to decide. Each of these steps is a fact. They're all verifiable. So unlike the opinions of some politicians who may uh, opine on certain things, these are, these are the kinds of real life happenings that we were called upon to report and that you need to know about. There's a court record. There are arguments on both sides. There are people you can call who file amicus briefs uh, in order to influence the court. All of these things are part of the process of government that we need to be reporting on and that should be our first and our primary responsibility. Do you know what a writ of certiorari is? Well, you can look it up. That's something that journalists do all the time. It's part of our job to check on what we know and make sure that it's backed up by the evidence. We read court records. Like I said, that was one of the, uh, one of the highlights of my job was reading any court document. And we try to demystify the processes that we are covering and avoid jargon. Good journalists explain stuff. We're like librarians. We can track anything down. And this is the public service we provide. You're welcome. And good journalism should feel like an educational experience. It's one of the reasons I got into the business, was to help educate people. And it's one of the reasons why I then was comfortable moving into ed education. It's fun to figure things out, especially if you have to do it in a hurry. It's kind of a rush. If you want one of my measures for judging good journalism, it should provoke the question, did I learn something today? And answer it with, hell yes. Okay, it's true. We're, we're begging, we're trying to get, back, get some of our respect back. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the example of the media pushing the idea that Iraq had weapons of destruct, mass destruction in 2003 is a, is a painful example to bring up. Uh, I'm about to go to uh, talk to more students in China. I've been invited to the city of Chongqing and uh, talk to them about the history of our profession and it includes um, many painful examples of where the media has lost its way. Uh, one of those is the, I was talking to uh, Eric about this, the McCarthy era, uh, when one lawmaker's regular recitation of lists of communists and positions of power uh, were covered all too eagerly by the press. Some of you may have been around back then. Um, I only know this from newsreels. Could this ever happen again, that the press would flock too eagerly to the assertions uh, of a demagogue. Is that possible? I think it is. Could we ever have a man in a position of power who makes up facts which are then repeated by news people and given a semblance of credibility through that repetition? Never happen again, right? <laughs> but when we do good, we actually save people from the kind of ignorance that can kill them. As I've said, this is one of the things that attracted me to public radio in the first place. I like to ask questions, figure stuff out, and help explain it. I worked on the science unit at NPR for a time, and we were so proud and so happy to be able to explain stuff to people, knowing that that knowledge could save their lives. The digital revolution has been a boon to explanatory version of journalism. Just take a look at Vox sometime. I don't know if you're familiar with the website Vox, uh, started by a former Washington Post reporter. Um, 
and, uh, and look, for example, at their explanation about how immunization works and that it's a community effort, that unless almost everybody gets immunized, nobody is immunized. Uh, okay, uh, it's a good point. There are some people in Montana who don't support uh, the idea of being forced to immunize their children. Uh, the Montana legislature recently considered um, uh, loosening the restrictions on children who go to school with uh, exemptions for getting uh, vaccinations. Um, my job, our job, the job of people who do science reporting is simply to explain that science supports immunization. I grew up when kids got the measles still. Um, I, I thought that was gone. Now it's not our job to question the reasons why people get religious exemptions for their, for their vaccines, but it is our job to show people that in parts of the country where there's a higher rate of opting out of those vaccines, um, people take advantage of that opportunity. Now, this is from the Centers for Disease Control Prevention, a reputable outfit. How do I know? Because I worked with them. Re um, reporters I've worked with have worked with the CDC a lot. They're scientists, and when they're on their game, they know the difference between coincidence and causality. And yes, our immunization rates in Montana could be higher, but they could also be lower. Uh, thank goodness for Idaho, they have lower vaccination rates. Uh, over there. Now, um, do you know how to look up your vaccination rates? Well, uh, I, I could show you if you want to come around afterwards. I have a link right here to the CDC uh, website that shows you what the vaccination rates. They're high. They're in the 90s, but there are still a lot of people in this state and many others who, for whatever reason, uh, are not vaccinating their kids. We haven't had an outbreak in Montana that I know of. Um, but it's always, um, it's something that journalists take very seriously. Now, um, data journalism has made uh, great strides. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, our, my profession has been pushing for is giving you the choice to get to the data that's behind some of these stories so that if you think if somebody is making something up, you should be able to, uh, to get to the data that actually made that, that, that assertion. Um, the Post and the Times both uh, were uh, reviewed recently by a journalistic study, and they found that a lot of newspapers don't cite their sources carefully enough. Now, if you find yourself on a website that doesn't cite any of its sources, what does that tell you? Maybe they don't have any. Maybe they're making that stuff up. This is part of the job of a modern consumer. To be honest, I think this was always your job was to ask these questions. Um, but um, arguably, it's getting easier to do because uh, the, the data can be posted there. You couldn't include data like this in a newspaper link. Now, um, data journalism is not going to be our salvation. Uh, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but um, I do hope that we will be able to bring back um, the comics, which is something that people regularly used to approach me on the street about uh, in Missoula. Uh, that and uh, asking if I could please make sure that the paper newspaper doesn't go away, because we still have a lot of fans of that. and I. Uh, may, I, you, you're obviously in agreement about that. You don't want the paper paper to go away. Newspaper. You have a newspaper, okay. <laughs> All right. So part of the problem here is the battle for our attention. We were talking uh, with Eric's students about the fact that uh, the news media, uh, when, I, when I was growing up, we sat down and we watched the evening news with Walter Cronkite, and the news was a very separate part of our day. Um, now, where do you get your news? You get it on your phone. Where, what else do you get on your phone? You get calls from your mother. You get texts from your girlfriend. You get uh, weather information. Uh, you play Candy Crush. Um, so we are now uh, part of this competition to get the attention of, um, 
of our viewers, uh, and, and frankly, we face some very stiff competition. This is a quote from the CEO of Netflix who, said, who indicated that his um, biggest competition is sleep, that people are, uh, he wants people to choose to stay up and watch movies instead of going to sleep. I'm not sure how, how comfortable I feel with that, but I feel like this is one of the reasons why people seem angry uh, with the media, or maybe they're just angry about being overwhelmed by information. Um, it's worth asking whether we're being asked to do too much, uh, and I'm not the first to suggest that we're suffering from some sort of overload. Um, I'm excited about new projects that re-examine this problem. We were talking today about um, a new uh, Dutch site called The Correspondent that's coming out. The Correspondent promises to subsist ad-free and to reject the breaking news cycle that has helped turn news into a throwaway commodity in which every tiny development overwhelms everything that came before it. Talk to journalists who work in the breaking news business and they'll describe the pressure they feel to gin up stories as something that predates social media and might be better traced to the 24-hour cable news cycle, which uh, for many, many of us got started uh, after the Gulf War. Uh, I worked at NPR at that time. We went to a 24-hour news cycle. We started a new program called Talk of the Nation, which was on uh, all afternoon, basically, because we felt the hunger for news was so urgent. And of course, once you make that commitment, you, it's very difficult to go back again. We're also uh, suffering from the rebellion against technology. Um, at, the, at the same time as people are uh, becoming closer with their phones, there's a movement to, to get people off of their phones. While we look to save us, we're writing more and more about the tech malaise the deleterious effect that screen time is having on our children and on human relationships. Uh, yes, it's true that the journalists are partly at fault for that. Um, I covered the tech beat in the 1990s when the first tech boom happened. Uh, we made promises uh, that, that technology never could have possibly uh, delivered uh, then. And now we're... Um, uh, in a role where we have to write about some of the, um, the negative effects of, of all of this screen time. Now, um, before we get to your questions, I want to point out a few things that I'm sure are obvious to everyone in this audience, and that is that great journalism is still alive. That as much as we talk about the problems in our profession, uh, just look around uh, if you have the opportunity. I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal because they actually deliver to Missoula, unlike the New York Times. And I am constantly astounded at some of the, the reach that the journal uh, has. I'm a bit of a business nerd. Um, imagine the resources that it takes to investigate the collapse of a mining dam in Brazil, so far away from your home base. Uh, but here it is, an investigative report um, that, uh, that looks at a very complicated regulatory system in a foreign language, in a foreign country, and takes it seriously. Uh, now, this, of course, is this journal's strengths. They're interested in, um, in business news. They're, um, they, they have uh, sources in this area, but it's still a tremendous public service and expenditure of resources um, to, to do something like this. No amount of fact-checking or hand-wringing about screen glut can obscure the power of stories like this or the investigative work that's being done right now by reporters who want to know why two 737 Maxes have crashed. Um, I will guarantee you the journalists will get to the source of this problem before the aviation investigators will. And even though the aviation investigators know the subject better, we, we often get there first and we often enable people to make changes to airplanes and to safety systems uh, first. Uh, here's another great example. Um, this is uh, a series that the Missoulian did. This is a Missoulian reporter who both reported on alternative therapy programs uh, and also spent time in them when she was a teenager. 
Um, it was a great series that has now led to hearings that are going on, I believe, right now in Helena as part of the legislative session to try to impose stricter regulation uh, on, on these schools. Uh, some of my colleagues at NPR, Corey Turner and Chris Arnold, did an, a year-long investigation about TEACH grants, which were supposed to be grants to people who wanted to go into the teaching profession in uh, challenging areas, in low-income areas, and they were supposed to uh, absolve those grants after you taught for a certain number of years. Instead, they were turned into loans that carried interest and wrecked people's careers. Um, these reporters uh, uncovered how these teachers were being uh, mistreated. The, the teachers themselves were powerless to do anything about it. Uh, the, this story uh, got thousands of those loans excused. And who else covers their own industry and their own problems in, the, in their own industry like the media? Uh, we talk about our own uh, challenges all the time. Uh, we're not ashamed of that. Uh, I, think, I, I don't know if it's unique, but I think it's unusual for, uh, for other industries to underscore the problems that, we're, that they're having. But we do that because we believe in transparency. We believe that if we're having trouble, you should know about it. And maybe you'll want to do something about it. Maybe you'll want to subscribe to a newspaper. Hell, I don't know. So what's the way forward? Well, if I knew that, um, I'm not sure I'd have to be here talking with you. I could go out and make some very shrewd investments uh, of my own. But I don't think that appealing to the traditional role of the press and saying that our country can't live without uh, a democratic press, I'm not sure that that's going to do it. Uh, remember, the First Amendment says, and I think Eric alluded to this, that gov government shall make no law restricting the freedom of the press. It doesn't say there has to be a press, because it was assumed that there was going to be one. And frankly, there wasn't much of one back then when the First Amendment was written. There were a few pamphleteers. So like Eric said, we, we depended on technology to bring about the robust media environment that we now have. And it's quite possible that technology could diminish it. There's no government guarantee that we're going to have the media. Uh, it also doesn't say that the press must be protected against um, trolls or against attacks by the President of the United States. This is something that we can speak out against, that you can speak out against if you think it's wrong, uh, but it's not prohibited. And let's be honest, we no longer rule the roost the way we used to. A hundred years ago, citizens had no choice but to rely on scarce sources of information. Today, they do. The value proposition has changed. You can all publish, right? You don't have to have a printing press. You don't have to have a Pulitzer or a William Randolph Hearst behind you to publish. Now, we're not the first industry to face technological and social changes that have challenged our existence. Railroad workers and coal miners um, have been through this. They also felt, thought that their jobs were essential. Um, and it makes me uneasy to hear us pushing for regulations that would protect us from these pressures. In other countries, like uh, Great Britain, um, there are studies, like the Cairn Cross Review, that are urging um, the government to get involved, to try to protect the press. The Cairn Cross Review recommends codes of conduct for relationships between Google and Facebook to benefit news creators. It says the CBC should share its expertise with local publishers. It recommends direct funding um, of the media, creation of an institute for public interest news. And the BBC has already um, created a local democracy reporting project. Um, this uh, report recommends expanding that. Now, would that work in this country? Is that what you would like to see, is government getting involved in uh, protecting the media? It's hard to imagine today, and I'm not sure how I would feel about that. Maybe we'll get more desperate in a, few year, in a few years. But you tell me how we can segue from two and a half centuries of mostly privately funded media into a world where the government would play a strong financial role without any editorial input. Now, my final point is about reader and listener and viewer education. As educators, that's still my official role. Um, sorry. I'm I'm going to skip through some slides. Um, one, of, one of the problems that we face 
is that our viewer and listenership uh, can't tell the difference between an opinion and a fact. Okay? And um, a majority of Americans could correctly identify three of five statements that were facts uh, as opposed to opinions. And I'll, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. <laughs> yes, this is my turn to, to, uh, to blame, the, blame the readers. So here's an example. Spending on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid make up the largest portion of the federal budget. Regardless of whether you know if that's true or not, is that something that's a potential fact? It is. It either is or it isn't. There's a pie chart, okay? Immigrants who are in the U.S. illegally are a very big problem for this country. It's an opinion, right? Because it's, it's, uh, it's something that requires facts, right? But there's no evidence behind it. I'll give you a couple more examples. President Obama was born in the United States. It's a fact. It also, also happens to be true. <laughs> Abortion should be legal in most cases. Depends, okay? Well, in this study that I'm citing, um, people were only 50, if only 60% only 60, 60 of the time were they able to make that basic distinction. Forget about the fact whether or not that thing was actually true. They weren't able to make that distinction. We need to educate our public. And that's one thing the School of Journalism uh, stood, stands for and, and stood for when I, when I was there. Uh, the CJ, this Columbia Journalism re uh, Review poll uh, that I'm referring to also uh, found that 60% of respondents believe reporters get paid by their sources. I wish. <laughs> Nobody ever offered me any money to talk to them. Um, that's not how it works. If anything, some journalists uh, get in trouble for paying their sources, but it never, it never works this way. So there's a lot of misunderstanding, and that's our fault, right? I'm not blaming you guys. We need to do more to help educate our viewers and our readers and our listeners uh, so they can, be, they can become better consumers if we neglected that story. Um, so, uh, and now it's time for me to stop talking because I know there are important questions that you have, uh, like who's going to win the election. Uh, but remember, I can't predict the future. Thank you very much. So I, I hope that you have questions and I will uh, repeat them for the recording. Uh, yes, please, sir. I, Okay, I'm, I'm girding my loins. I've been uh, a reader of the New York Times for decades and decades. Uh, it's supposedly the publication of record in the United States. And I find that more and more what I see in the New York Times is either A, just opinion writing, hmm. or B, speculation about what's going to happen. And it seems like both of those things are at the expense of just telling us what did happen like yesterday. Do you agree with that? Am I, am I on something? Or am I no, I, I do. We, I, again, we were talking about this earlier today. I also have, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the thing that got me into journalism was when they started printing copies in the Bay Area where I lived when I was about uh, 20 years old. And I, and I finally, I didn't have to read the San Francisco Chronicle any longer. And I said, wow, there's a world out there. Uh, the New York Times is God. It's the Bible. It's, uh, it's very important. And, it's a, and you should know, it's important to journalists, too. I mean, we, we competed with each other. We criticized the Times. But it is a unique institution. And I think, if, and if anything, the, uh, its role has grown, OK? But I, I have to agree, and this is an opinion, it's not a fact, um, that uh, their perception of their role in uh, challenging uh, things that the president says, in particular, has gone off the rails. I, I don't know how, I, I don't feel that they're doing me a favor um, by, we were talking about, the, I, I read, the, I don't know how you read it, I read it on the tablet, so there's still a little bit of a front page Okay, there's still a few articles that appear as opposed to on your screen where you n never really are quite sure what the positioning is. 
And it's usually all, it's usually all Trump all the time. Um, so I, I don't know if, if I'm responding to what you're seeing, but that, um, that they view themselves as in it being in a pitched battle. And I think uh, Dean Becke, who is the executive editor of the Times, who visited uh, the University of Montana uh, f uh, four years ago at my invitation, um, has said as much that he feels that um, the president's challenging of the truth has put them in, has created a unique obligation for them. And I don't see it that way. I, I, I think the presentation of the facts in and of itself is, um, is enough, and that as reasonable human beings, we have to believe in that, even if, uh, as we were discussing, there's increasing evidence that presenting people with the facts doesn't change their minds, right? You still have to do the right thing, to quote Spike Lee, right? You still have to follow your, your North Star. And our North Star sh should be that. So, so I, I, I agree, and I don't know how to express that. I get to express it by, uh, hopefully, by doing journalism that, that does follow the, the, the right path. But I'm disturbed, too. I'm, I'm curious, if in part, what's going on is economics here. It seems to me uh, it takes a lot of time, effort, and money to really go out there and generate the facts. You sort of alluded to that. Whereas, you know, a uh, facile opinion writer can sit at his desk and it's just one person and they, you know, crank out opinion pieces uh, and it doesn't cost the times as much, therefore, to become so opinion oriented as when back in the old day, I would claim that it was. I'd say that something. Well, I'd say a version of what you're saying I, I would agree with. Um, Maybe more for other publications, though, than the Times, because they spend money on their opinion writers, right? I mean, Tom Friedman, uh, uh, you know, and um, uh, uh, Maureen Dowd. These, these people are are not working for free. So um, the prominence that they enjoy on the on the front page or whatever you're you're seeing um, is is a conscious decision. Um, I'd say that it's more true for something like BuzzFeed, which it's not, um, the clickbait that they're creating there is not uh, opinion writers, it's listicles and, and other silliness, which, and it is an economic decision to say we're going to attract more eyeballs by covering that stuff than by than covering the news. So I, I, I would disagree a little bit with, with, the, with the Times. I think the Times does see this as a, as a mission. Uh, I think I also see it as they are in a, um, a newspaper war with the Washington Post right now. Some people think that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of fun to watch that there's actually, you know, we used to have newspaper wars when there were lots and lots of newspapers. Now we have fewer newspapers and these two are going at each other. And I think that that seems to have upped the ante. And reporters for those publications have talked about that. As, and I think Jill Abramson talks about it in her book as well, that um, the, the uh, um, entry of Jeff Bezos into the Post's uh, ownership structure uh, really made, made the Times up their game a little bit. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't uh, you know, absolve the Post from the same accusations. And, and I think out here it's very challenging for us because we depend really heavily on these publications to find out what's going on um, in Washington. So you do have a choice. There is other stuff to read. Uh, and, and there is stuff behind the, the front page of the Times, right? So, I, you know, you, you, could go, you can actually customize the Times now, uh, the Times web page now, so that uh, you see less of that stuff. If you hang around, we'll, we'll play with your uh, computer afterwards if you, if you want to. But they, they are trying to give you that option. And I find, like, you know, if I sit down on Sunday and I don't read the front page, but I just read the magazine, sometimes I feel like a better person. <laughs> yes. So let's go back to your weapons of mass destruction example of when the media blew it, right? So to what extent is that the responsibility of the media, and to what extent you were quoting people, public official, elected officials, um, various sources that perhaps weren't <coughs> truthful or accurate? Um, so where does the responsibility really lie when you're quoting experts who are misleading you? Oh, I'm, ha I'm happy to blame the experts uh, every time. But the truth is, uh, we are supposed to be truth squatting the experts. Uh, we are supposed to, and there were organizations like McClatchy News is sort of known for 
famously uh, questioning the WMD rationale. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, of, of course, we're, we, we, we are, we are so the, 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 another speech in which I t talk about the fact that, um, you know, we, we, when we were on the Panetta plane, we used to tease ourselves about the fact that, you know, we're just stenographers to power, right? That's sort of a, uh, a slap that's given to the media. We just write down what other people say, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, in a sense we do, right? Like you do have to write down what the president says because what he says matters. Um, but you must place it in context, you know? Uh, so uh, Ju Judith Miller, um, you know, uh, was given much too long a leash, and I think there's, there's kind of agreement about this, as she was the reporter with the New York Times who uh, took a lot of the bait that the, uh, both the Iraqi um, uh, ex government in exile was feeding them and the Defense Department and the State Department was feeding them um, and didn't question it. And if I believe everything that a government official told me, you know, I would have been out of, jo out of a job a long so time ago. Failed because you didn't scrutinize yes. Right. Absolutely, yeah. And there, were, there are ways to, it's hard, because you're talking about Iraq, you're talking about a country that is a, you know, at that time was a dictatorship. So it was pretty difficult to get in there and, and, and move around and verify, um, uh, you know, whether there were weapons of mass destruction. But the onus should have been on the government to prove it, rather than the onus being on the citizens of the United States and on the media to disprove their assertion. Right. And, they, and they didn't prove it, right? So, so again, we have I get to, to repeat what we're, uh, if you repeat a fact often enough, it starts to gain currency. We, that's part of what happened then, and I would say that is often what's happening uh, with our current White House. So, so I, would, I, I would not say that we, uh, Get a, get a clean slate wiped. But yes, yeah, some of those people should have gone to prison. Some of those public officials should have gone to prison too, I think. Yes? This kind of plays off of that first question, but a while ago I talked to a political candidate who said he has to believe that there will be a return to quality so that news feels a little more objective and a little less <coughs> commentary so that you have coming to post on one side and uh, mm -hmm. Fox News on the other side. And he said, I have to believe that we'll come to a spot where there's something more in the middle. And I'm wondering if you think there's an appetite for that among the public and if it's happening. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, so, you know, we talked about the historical role of the press. The historical role of the press has been partisanship in this country, right? The, the window of time in which it was expected that the media would be objective and fair and balanced is, you know, I'm, I'm not the greatest media historian, but it's narrow, right? It really came out of, you know, one, one reading is that um, in, the, uh, early, in the, uh, the early part of the 20th century, that the media was so partisanship with yellow journalism, uh, with William Randolph Hearst driving us into war with Spain, that there was a correction. And our great journalism, which was founded in 1920, was part of the correction. It was a, a turn to quality. We need to train these people. We can't just put any ink stained wretch in front of a newspaper, okay? And, um, and so there was a, a, a period there, as some would say it was really after World War II, and, in the Watergate era, where you, where you had um, this this sense of public responsibility, but but that for through most of our history, the press has been um, tainted by bias. So um, so I would say you know the I, I I would not be surprised if we continue to see this the pendulum swing. The only um, the the solution to me is not getting rid of partisanship. It's uh, increase of choice, okay? So, you know, I'm lucky, I'm, you know, I, I know how to look around and find stuff that I trust. I still read the New York Times. I just flip past the stuff that I know that's biased. I hope that everybody can get to the point where they feel like I know how to find stuff that I believe, that I trust, and I know how to scrutinize it, like I said, by looking up some of the information or 
uh, dismissing uh, commentators who you know are, are, are full of crap. Um, but, uh, I, but I don't know that, that I see us returning to uh, necessarily returning to quality just because the, the economics have not settled out behind that. Right? I, I have a follow-up. Sure. Sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> but I have a friend in Helena who just started, or it's been running for a little while now, <coughs> Yes, yes, we should all be reading them. Yes. Kind of yeah. But um, he and a few other people seem to think that that's a good model. And it will yeah. Be you I, I do. Yeah, so the, the Montana Free Press is one of many publicly supported uh, organizations or others, Techless Monthly and ProPublica, um, Center for Public Integrity. Um, there, there are lots of different models, and some of them uh, uh, take different kinds of support. Some places uh, will take foundation support. Some places won't. Uh, I used to work for National Public Radio. It's also publicly supported. Did you send your money in on the pledge drive? You know, it's, a, it's another variation of that. And they also take a little bit of, uh, of government money. So I think that those models have great promise. They're, they're doing wonderful work. Um, I, I, I hope that uh, the, the, the free press uh, survives, especially because um, you know we, we don't have a lot of competition in Montana, right? How many newspapers do you guys have here? Do you have one and a half? Do you have two? Or, or so there's no free. Uh, is there an independent weekly? Independent monthly. There's the independent monthly. Uh, oh, it's Montana Press. Okay, okay. So in because you know in Missoula we just lost the independent last year, right? So that was our alternative voice. It was both alternative culturally. It was alternative. Uh, ownership, it was uh, everything the Missoulian was, uh, was not. So, so again, I think cho you know, choice is the answer as much as there's, uh, there's an answer. And I, I, would, I, I think particularly during the legislative session is a great time to check out the free press because they're doing a very interesting job of uh, covering certain bills in, uh, in great depth. And that's, that's pretty hard to get here because there are not a lot of state house reporters. So go team. Yes. I have a very related question. Um, what can the media do to reduce like the hyper partisanship that's going on? Or should the media have a role in that? But you know, we're getting more and more and more polarized. Many agree that's not a great thing. So what's the role of the media in maybe tamping that down? I don't know. Maybe you guys should answer that. Um, I'm, I, w I wonder whether that's. Um, that, that isn't a role that I embrace, except insofar as um, responsible reporting is not simply incendiary, right? So that each story, you know, each story should be judged by its, uh, you know, I, I worked in the world where I got to do a story, and I got to present different sides, and if I didn't achieve uh, balance or fairness in that story, then I did it in the next one, or the next one, or the next one, or over my whole career, or something like that. Um, you know, in the world of cable news, uh, you often put people together in the hopes that they will, you know, go full Jerry Springer on one another. Um, so, but I don't know if that's the reason why we're polarized. You know, I do. I and and I don't know whether the the the, the media. I don't know if the media can can um, expunge that. I think the media should co should not cover it, um, except to the extent that it's uh, responsibly covered. <laughs> and in, in other words, that we should we should reflect polarization to the extent that it's important, not feed off of it in order to get readers or make people cry. But I'm not sure if that's our. I don't know. Do you guys think it's our job to do, to play down to diminish partisanship? Do we get everybody to agree? No? Sometimes we have to disagree, right? We fought a civil war once, right? We should have, that was, that was, I don't know if it was a good thing to do, but that was something that had to happen at that time. If somebody had come in in 1860 and said, listen, you know, these people in the South, they're really not so bad, you know, they're, uh, and people did say that, right? People did, they said, yeah, they're, they're taking really good care of their slaves. These people couldn't live otherwise. 
So I don't know if that's our job to get people to, uh, to get along. Some people are, 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 are not going to get along. <laughs> yes, sir. I came because kind of what she's talking about. Go ahead. I'm just going to get some water. Oh, um, I guess I can do this. Yeah. Somewhere around 2008, Thanks. the local paper had an article about Republicans spending $30 million and how bad it was. And then further on down, it got to combine, they, sp they spent $70 million. Okay, take 30 away from 70, who's spending more? The Democrats. But that was not the point of the article. The part of the article was to trash the Republicans. Okay, not that I think Republicans are best. That's not my point. My point is, is what she's talking about is why is there so much bias? And you, I don't mean to pick this on you, but three times you have trashed the president tonight. And I voted for him mm -hmm. because I knew he would give the reporters four years of hell. That's the <laughs> only reason I voted for him. Because I was sick and tired of the media telling me how to think, telling me what I should do on election night. I went to bed at 9 o'clock. And prior, prior to that, my wife was telling me things that would happen on the phone. I said, don't. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I went to bed. She woke me up at 2 in the morning, something like that. Said, Donald Trump won. I said, no, he didn't. She said, yes, he did. I said, no, he didn't. Leave me alone. I got up the next morning, still believing that Hillary was president. Got on the news, and I'm like, my God, this woman was right. He did win. And so I'm here tonight hoping that somehow the media will stop. Because they, didn't, they did not say, you're right, we made a mistake with Hillary. No, they moved on to Russia, Russia, Russia. Have they, have they got to the point of Russia doesn't exist? Some of us in the real world, not in a bubble, realize this is all fabricated. And so I came tonight hoping that there was some hope that we'd get back to news, real news, <coughs> and not Russia, Russia, Russia. Okay. Well, I haven't talked about Russia, uh, and I'm not going to. Um, and uh, I would, uh, you know, did not mean to uh, undermine the president's credibility, except to the extent that he, his uh, oratory has made us question uh, the kind of reporting that I'm talking about. That, that regardless of what the, that, that, that facts still matter. And I hope that we can agree on that. And that facts should be presented in a transparent way. I agree. Uh, okay. Okay. Absolutely. But I'm saying is what you said. You were trashing him as a person. Okay. And you didn't give us any information, no, no real data to support your position against him. You've just been throwing out, well, this administration. Like we all know how bad they are. Some of us don't believe that. Okay. I no, that's Do you that's see what fine. I'm saying? sure. Sure. Okay, so are you going to give me hope? That was my question. Is there hope? What I hear from you is that the newer, you, when you read, you just go past these biased people. And I'm asking, why don't they stop? Stop their bias. But people have a right to be, I mean, people have a right to political opinions, right? I mean, that, that's a fundamental American We're talking right. About well, Are yes, we but talking about opinion pieces? well, <laughs> journalism includes opinion pieces, right? It, it, journalism always has; it's always been an important part of what we do. Uh, this gentleman was saying that he finds that the opinion pieces are, you know, too present, too uh, occupying too much space. That he would like to see more uh, of the fact stuff. I, I urged him to to go look for it because I think that it's definitely there. But um, the idea that we would get away from opinion and return to you know some sort of golden mean I, I think uh, 
you know, is, is a fantasy, right? It's a world that we have never lived in. Where, where, every, where everything was presented straight. I, I, I know I'm, I'm frequently reminded you know, of sort of the, the Walter Cronkite era uh, as, as being kind of a golden age when people feel like they were getting the truth from an, from an oracle. Uh, we're not going back to that. Um, you know, and I, I can tell you that uh, you know, Walter Cronkite eventually expressed his opinions uh, on the air about the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, so, so um, I thought I was gently needling the president. <laughs> if you want to hear me trash the president, come over to my house sometime. Yeah. That's okay. But you you didn't needle any other president, and it's obvious. It's obvious, in my opinion, you lean extremely left, and some of us on the right would like a little bit of, you know, a little bit of help. You you have a lot. You have a lot of help. You have an entire ca cable television network. Do, do, well, do, do, well. I don't listen to cable. Okay. Well, there's there's a cable network which I'm sure you've heard of called Fox that that would give you an unending stream of people who okay. who agree with but you and and what some. For. You you want you want well, balance. Uh, well. So that I can make a decision. Okay. I'm the youngest child. Yeah. <laughs> youngest children don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> they don't okay. know that. But they don't, they like giving you give you the information. All right, you make a great point. Um, yes, go ahead. Are you going to ask this question together? Yeah, I, it's okay. Yeah. Just, she, <laughs> let me go for it. We're, okay. we're married. Oh, well, <laughs> Congra <laughs> congratulations. Let me hoist myself on my own petard. Well, I think this gentleman uh, illustrates a point. And it's <clears throat> very, I mean, we, we have a president who's called the media the enemy of the people. Um, and it, we have, we are very divided in what we watch and what we listen to. Um, as you, you refer to Walter Cronkite, I grew up watching Walter Cronkite. <clears throat> we used to trust the media a lot more yes. than we do now. Um, if you're on the left, maybe you read the Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, if you're on the right, maybe you read the Wall Street Journal's editorial section and you watch Fox News. Um, I, I don't expect the media to um, sort of dampen these uh, things, but can we get past this tremendous division that we have in lack of trust in, 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 in a situation where everybody is going to find out their own truth and with their own sort of self-reinforcing right. media? Right. So, uh, so, so let me just give, give you, you know, the one point of that that, I, that I'm starting to understand, and again, we talked about today, that the, the word that you use that um, really rang with me is the sort of lack of trust. That, and, and I think that um, that is not unique to the media, that we have lost trust in government. Uh, we've lost trust, some people have lost trust in higher education. Uh, I see your, your badge. Um, and uh, I, I think that the, the, the media is, yeah, and the, and the media is, is caught up in that, I think. If, now, I was telling you, so this is very relevant to me now because I'm going to China next week, right, where trust in government is high, in, in case you haven't heard, and, tr <laughs> and trust in the media is high because the media, the media is controlled by the, by the government. So we're going to have some very interesting discussions, I, I hope, uh, if President Xi allows it, um, about, um, you know, how... What, what, is, what is the problem with American media? Some, some would argue, well, it, it is the lack of trust. It is the cynicism, right? And that it's not a problem that is unique to um, the media, that we have to somehow restore trust in our own institutions and, um, and report on them. Uh, we were also talking a little bit about um, there's a movement uh, around now that you may or may not hear about called Solutions Journalism that uh, blames some of the 
uh, malaise, the feeling of uh, exhaustion that some people have with the fact that the media is often uh, critical. Okay? Now, this is the kind of journalism that I grew up doing, is critical media and, be, and being skeptical. But some people feel that um, there's a need to propose solutions, to look at solutions, to examine what people are doing in their everyday lives. And so there's a foundation that is out there funding projects. They just did one in Montana a year or so ago about how local communities are trying to, to stop population decline in, small, in rural America. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's one person's answer to trying to tell positive stories. Um, you know, if you are a traditional journalist like I am, it's hard to swallow that because you feel like you need to take an unjaundiced look at everything. You know, cast a cold eye uh, and, and uh, looking for solutions seems like a kind of a bias or wishful thinking. Um, but I almost feel like this is sort of a spiritual problem that the country has. Uh, that it's not just a matter of disagreeing, but that we that we don't trust each other anymore. So, any more? Uh, Erica, like one more question. Uh, this uh, this woman, yes. Hi. Um, my name is Alexa Duels. I'm a sophomore at Elgin High. What advice might you have for someone who wants to be a journalist in the next seven to eight years? And what might your career look like? Uh, go for it, man. <laughs> you will have a great time. No, well, you know. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, the, I didn't hear your name. Oh, Alexandria Wells. A Alexandria Wells from Belgrade. from Belgrade. Yeah. Okay, and you're in high school. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a newspaper at your school? Yeah, I put it together. Oh well, good. Well, I'd love to see it. Um, and she was asking what advice I would give to somebody who's thinking about going into journalism, and and I said go for it because it is a great career. It is so if you like to talk to people, you know that's why I put that picture up there. Those. I still love to do that, you know, even when I'm, when I'm not a journalist. I was with my wife uh, the other day, and we, we were, I'm in a first aid class, and we sat down with some of the students in the first aid class. My wife's also a journalist, and, she, and we were having beers, and, she, and I look over at her, and she's interviewing them. She's like, well, you know, when did, how did you get into this, and what did, where did your interest in healthcare come from? And, and <laughs> you know, I realized that we, um, you know, we have the disease, right? We can't stop talking. Um, so if you love that, and if you love to work your ass off, um, then you should go for it. The only thing I do tell people is that this is not an easy choice, right? This is not a, oh, I don't know what to do, I think I'll go into journalism choice anymore, okay? This is a tough road to hoe. <laughs> and um, you really have to want it. You really have to kick butt. Now, I just got an internship for a student of mine uh, who graduated last year from the J School uh, in Washington, D.C. I didn't get it for her, but I mean, I wrote her a letter of recommendation, so, so I take full credit for it. She got the internship, and I helped her. Um, so, you know, and, I, and one of the things I, I, I said about her, I said, you guys need more geographical diversity in the headquarters at, at NPR. You need, these Montana kids are amazing. They've done all kinds of things that uh, city kids don't do, they're independent, they're polite, they're positive, spirited, they're optimistic, you know, bring somebody from Montana, and, and so they are. And, and I would like to see more Montana kids uh, get into all kinds of media. So I would urge you to, uh, to go for it. We have a great school, uh, in-state rates, supply, um, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but don't, don't just stick your toe in the water. Really, really go into it. And you, you live in an era now where you can be a journalist yesterday, right? You can be writing, you can be, you're obviously already publishing, you can write your own blog, you can write a podcast, I'll help you get it started. Uh, there's nothing holding you back uh, the way there, there, there used to be. So, have fun. Okay. So I think that's a, a great note. Um, please join me in thanking our guest one more time.